going to call the Washington Central Unified Union School District School Board meeting to order today, October 18th. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us remotely. We have a lot of part participants today, which is exciting to see a lot of public with us. Uh, so I'm going to start with, are there any adjustments to the agenda? Please speak up, for members, because I don't see everybody. So if there's any, I don't see anybody raising their hand or saying anything. Seeing none, we're going to accept the agenda as it is. And I'm going to move into the reception of guests. And are, do we have any public comments? I just, the time limit is strictly enforced, as you guys all know. But we're happy that you are here. Uh, are there any public that would like to speak before we get started? We would also have public comments at the end of the meeting. And here's Natasha. OK. So we got everybody. Brian, like to, to speak. OK, thank you, Brian. Hold on one sec. Anybody else seeing? I don't see anybody else raising. Oh, Leslie. Hi, welcome, Leslie. OK. So let's go ahead. Brian, uh, go ahead. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Fisher, and I'm speaking you to you tonight as a parent, a taxpayer, and an employee of our district. I am concerned right now about the board's initial proposal to investigate a food service management company to replace the wonderful options we already have in our schools. Over the course of the last eight years I have been here, our labor force has shrunk at U32 from one director and six staff members to one director and three staff members. At the same time over the last eight years, our breakfast counts went from 12,213 to a record of 51,422. Our lunch counts went from 34,677 to a high of 65,405. Right now we are on track to break those numbers as well, with an average of almost 200 breakfasts and 400 lunches per day. The team has been working since August without a contract, and that's a lot of issues for a lot of people in Washington Central, as we can't figure out the, what the holdup is. This is all happening while some of us I'm sorry, while well, some of the team are trying to refinance homes, move, catch up on bills, buy groceries with an inflation level at an all time high. In addition to all these factors in Washington Central, the board exploring alternatives to the team does not feel collaborative or supportive of your employees who also live in your community. Your food service team spent over six months during the school year and the summer serving the community during the pandemic. The team then served over 1,400 meals per day in a very challenging environment, meeting regulatory guidelines for food, running into supply issues, while also meeting time deadlines to get the work done so the buses could roll out. We put our community first during the pandemic because we care about every family member in our district serves. This development is very troubling to all employees because the question is, who could be next? Janitorial for a cleaning service? Typically, RFPs for food service management companies is the type of action that is taken when there is a problem. However, I have never been approached with any concern. Our food service programs are self-funded, meaning we only spend the revenue we generate. The money we generate in revenue is in the form of reimbursements from the state, federal aid, and grants. Those revenues we generate help pay for salaries, benefits, supplies, and some equipment. These funds do not come from the main Washington Central budget. So a food service management company would not actually generate any savings. There has also been a lack of clarity around food service revenue, which is not managed by the food service department directly. This goes for U32, Rumney, and East Montpelier, where questions have been asked about current budgets and previous year's final numbers. We have yet to receive that communication, making it difficult for us to continue to manage the financial portion of our work. Without all the information, it is hard for us to do our job well. I am now going to comment to the bullet points in the Colt report tonight and the Finance Committee from last week. Number one, potential cost savings. There's a lot to cover here, but I'm going to keep it brief. Basically, there will be no cost savings as the program is self-funded, meaning it doesn't directly impact the school's budget. But what does that mean in terms of service to our students? We are U32 are striving to provide healthy options, quality service for our students. Please consider what is the real cost and what is the price? 
Number two, improvements to products and services. Typically with a food service management company, the quality falls downhill fast. This is because food service management companies are looking to make a profit and with only $2.28 for breakfast and $4.25 in reimbursements, there isn't much room to make their bottom line look good. Therefore, food quality suffers due to lower costs of value-added meals. Remember that their most important thing to these companies is to make money because these companies typically do not invest in their employees or provide benefits leading to significant turnover in staff. Number three, efficiencies. The food service management company sees most of their efficiencies in reducing labor costs. I use those would be as many pre-made meals as they can so they can cut those labor costs. You should know that the Abbey Group brought in a product called Lunchables by Oscar Mayer this year. Is this what you want for your children? Additional professional, professional expertise is number four. Our staff undergo eight hours a year of professional development on building relationships with students working in an educational setting. We've had student volunteers in our kitchens and model professionalism. We've taught classes for ink, made hot sauces and beef jerky. We know students' names, we smile, we are involved in our larger community. If you would like clarifications on my credentials, however, please feel free to refer to the resume I supplied back or submitted back in July of 2016. I'm sure you will be more than pleased with my knowledge base and expertise in food service. Number five, additional administrative support. After okay, speaking Brent, with Brent, the ACT- Brent, Brent, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. I just wanna give you, I, I, don't wait, wait a minute. I'm gonna let you finish. We just have two people, but we've gone over time already. So it just, if you, if you could, sort of wrap it up, that would be really helpful. Okay, go ahead. Just unmute yourself again. Sorry, you're muted right now. Brian, you can finish, just unmute yourself, just wrap it up. Thank Sorry. You. Yep, I only have a few sentences left. Um, additional administrative support is number five. After speaking with the Agency of Education, None of this paper will, will be removed from the district's responsibilities. In fact, it will probably grow. The district will now be responsible for more than just the month review of the food service management company. It will still have to submit reimbursements, direct certification, and harvest reporting. This is all about the social, emotional, and physical well being of our students. If you think a corporation is in, interested in interested solely in profit is going to make these things into account you're sadly mistaken if you decide to choose the bottom line tonight i encourage a further discussion with the current stakeholders that would be the food service workers the students the parents and other customers including teachers and people who have visited our school in order for a fair and just evaluation of our program not behind closed doors without accurate input thank you for your time and your ear tonight Thank you, Brian. We appreciate your comments. Leslie? Leslie, are you ready? There. We can see you and we can hear you so far. I'm, I'm, I, I think I have my I think I have my speaker. I can't get my camera, but that's all right. Okay. Um, good evening. My name. You just went out. We can't hear you. Leslie, Strong sorry. Office. You're going in and out, Leslie. I apologize, but we can't hear you clearly. I am speaking to you, our elected board, to express my strong objection to any proposal that would replace our current school food service programs in favor of a for-profit company. For-profit companies do not and will not save us money. Never forget, they make money from us for their stockholders. That is their purpose. Our food service staff are already among the lowest paid employees in our district. The thought that you are being asked to consider ending our successful and healthy food service programs in favor of a for-profit company that would replace our staff with workers paid lower with minimal, if any, benefits likely poverty level wages 
is unconscionable. If the board believes this would save us money, it might do so in the short term, but for-profit companies will not save us in the long term. We should not do this even for a small short-term gain on the backs of members of our community. We are better than this. We should be better than this. We have to be better than this. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, for our new board members, I just want to you know, clarify, uh, we, we do not respond to public comment. We appreciate the public comment, but unless it's on our agenda, we don't get involved in public comment at this at this moment. I see Lynn Willow, you have your hand up. If you have a, a comment that is related, I, I don't know exactly, you, you can speak at your student time if you have some input unless you have a comment related to something else. Lena, Willow, and do you have a question? If you have a comment from the students, that's okay at this time too, but I don't, I, I see this hand going up and down. What, you're good? <laughs> we, had a, we had a comment about the the topic going on right now. Okay, go ahead. As students, go ahead. Can you wait. No, you can go ahead. Make your um. Just to, okay. Okay. Just to go off what Leslie said is, especially Brian. Like, I see Brian maybe three times every day, and he is the first person people see when they start their day with a good morning. How are you? and he serves and our staff is really there's not a lot of staff members and so while they are there like they just do a ton of work and i would hate to see that stop in our school because they do play a huge part of in our community thank you guys okay uh, we're gonna move ahead and start a uh, and start our meeting let me just go back into a uh, the first part of our meeting today is our budget training. Uh, so I'm gonna give it to Megan and uh, and Suzanne to get us started. So the board is gonna go through some uh, budget training today, and this is for our new our and old board members, just to get us familiar with board learning. And here we go. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. It's gonna take me a second. Sorry. Okay, so as Flora said, um, this is the annual budget training. Pieces of tonight will be familiar from years past. It's a combination of um, a process overview, a little bit about how budgeting works in Vermont anyway, um, partially because we have new board members, but also we do it every year because um, it's a complicated funding mechanism. So, um, and there's some new information here that we are trying to present to you a little bit earlier in the process based on our reflections from last year. And I, Floor, I'll, I'll let you have this one. <laughs> okay, so this is our my one slide. It, so just as a, a reminder for all of our old members and our new board members, it, what our role is in budgeting. So you can see these three bullet points at the very top. This is the part of the essential work of school boards and you have this book with you, but overall we give guidance to the budget and priorities as well as budget parameters. And you guys know we work in the budget parameters already. It, the, our role is also to pay attention to the overall financial health of our district. And last, the input occurs through the identification of board priorities and not to the detail level. So what, uh, and the second part of this, uh, I, we added the district governance standards. We've been talking about this. We'll be complying with uh, district governance standards in July, 2025. So I wanted to add this here. And especially looking at the second quote uh, here is the school district prepares and presents an annual budget, which ensures compliance with federal and other budgeting requirements and demonstrates a clear connection to establish, to establish goals and priorities. 
and if applicable to the priorities of the school district. This is for SUs and we're not an SU anymore, the second part of the sentence. But what it, why is this uh, why, why does this matter? Because aligning our budget to our district priorities is a, because when we the spending is tracked against the district goals, the district in, ensures a, intentional spending and it helps us raise the student achievement. It, it means that the success of every single student relies on each and every dollar to say it in that way. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then the last thing that I would say is that doctor, uh, when we're looking at this, uh, our mindset should be stay in, in governance uh, and, not, and not politics. Uh, through board members as in, um, I don't know how to say this, um, Good, you know, good governance means looking at the big picture, like staying in the balcony, we keep saying, looking at the big picture, not at a particular issue, you know, sort of uh, this quote from 2020 in Educational Week, we had the opportunity to be in a panel with Megan last week with four new superintendents and a quote that they had in their packet grabbed my attention. And, and it, what this quote said in Educational Week was the survey found that a core lesson school board members learn through their board experience was good governance for budgeting means looking at the big picture, not at pet issues or just that one contentious constituency. So I just wanted to share that with you as we get started, it, sort of have that mindset as we get started. Megan. Yep, great. Um, so here's what we will do tonight. Um, we will do a little bit of overview of a funding system. Um, we will show the, <clears throat> the video that some of you, excuse me, have seen before. Um, excuse me. We will talk a little bit about our own budget design process and um, how we make the decisions, how we enter um, and how we have the multiple discussions. And then we will understand our current budget realities and a firm budget parameter. So that um, third to last bullet is an opportunity to get more information at this point in the process about where the current budget sits based on um, assumptions that we're making. So hopefully that is what we'll do tonight. And um, we will show <clears throat> this education funding video. And I am going to click this, and hopefully you will all see it and hear it. Hey guys, for real quick, let me give you a tip. And I will have to skip this out in a second. Video Sorry. In thousands of other than their property values. Um, you might want to check out I'll whether your own beginning. household On purpose of Vermont's current education funding system, you need to step back. Megan, I'm not hearing anything. I don't know if I'm the only large one. differences in property wealth resulted in unequal education opportunity for students based on their residence, a violation of the Vermont state constitution. Sorry, everyone. In response, Vermont's lawmakers enacted the Equal Education Opportunity Act of 1997, commonly known as Act 60. While Act 60 created school quality standards and performance requirements, the biggest change was a shift in responsibility for funding education. The state of Vermont now funds all public school district budgets approved by voters across the state. Features of Act 60 attempted to equalize many factors, student population or school size, local market value of property, student demographics, and student spending. Six years later, lawmakers passed Act 68, which modified the funding formula in hopes of simplifying the process without affecting the intent of the legislation. Equal education opportunity for all of Vermont students. Vermont pays for education through the state's education fund. There are four primary sources of money that comprise the fund. Revenue transferred from the state's general fund, a portion of general purpose taxes like sales and use, purchase and use, and state lottery, the non-residential education property tax, non-residential property is any property that is not a homestead, businesses, second homes, camps, etc., and the homestead property tax paid by Vermont homeowners, which has two components, payments based either on property value or household income or both. In fiscal year 2018, the expenses paid by the education fund totaled $1.58 billion. 
Now let's focus on understanding how property taxes are calculated as of fiscal year 2018. The first thing that happens is each district school board begins preparing a budget in the fall for consideration by the voters at annual school district meetings, which usually happen on or around town meeting day in March. Once a budget is approved, the state is obligated to fund the district's education spending from the education fund. Education spending is the amount of budgeted expenses minus local revenue and state and federal grants, including things like special education reimbursement, transportation aid, and small school grants. Local revenue may include tuition collected, interest on investments, and surplus carryovers. The amount of education spending for each district begins its homestead tax rate calculation. Next, the district's education spending is divided by the number of equalized pupils attending the district schools. What's an equalized pupil, you may ask? The state adjusts the number of students in a district by factors that reflect costs associated with certain demographics. High school students, for example, generally cost more to educate than elementary students, who in turn cost more than preschool students. English language learners and students from economically deprived backgrounds are weighted more heavily since their education costs are often higher. Like many of the calculations, this adjustment is made as a way to equalize the impact of dollars in each district. It's important to understand that the homestead tax rate doesn't reflect the total budget presented by the school board and approved by the voters. Homestead tax rates reflect education spending per equalized pupil. In fact, current law requires that school boards present information that specifically correlates the proposed budget to education spending per equalized pupil. Education spending per equalized pupil for each district is then compared to the property dollar equivalent yield. We'll just call that the yield. It's determined by a mathematical calculation of the amount per pupil spending supported each year by a fixed homestead tax rate of $1 per $100 of value. By way of example, if $1 tax rate would yield spending per equalized student of $10,000 and a district presents a budget that it has spending per equalized pupil at $15,000, then that district tax rate would be $1.50. But wait, there's more. The final step in determining the homestead tax rate is the state's method of equalizing property value by comparing actual sales data to assess values in each town. The result is the common level of, of appraisal, or CLN a ratio applied to the tax rate to normalize home values. Those are the components of the basic formula for calculating homestead property tax. Education spending divided by the equal number of pupils divided by the yield equals the tax rate. The tax liability is calculated by dividing the homestead tax rate by the common level of appraisal and then multiplying by the assessed value divided by 100. Let's make some sense of this, okay? Meet Jane. She lives in St. Albans City, which is a part of the newly unified Maple Run Unified School District. She's voted in support of the school board's proposed budget, as did the majority of the voters in the district. Maple Run's fiscal year 2018 education spending was $37,952,236 for 2,527.3 equalized pupils. So education spending per pupil was $15,016.91. Jane and her friends approved a fiscal year 2018 budget that was 47.8% higher than the yield of $10,160 set by the legislature. As a result, their homestead property tax rate increased by that amount to $1.47.8 per $100 of assessed property value. So what did that mean for Jane? Her house in St. Albans City was assessed for $251,300, where the Vermont Tax Department established the CLA at 94.99%, meaning that the average assessed value of properties in the city that sold over the past three years was 94.99% of the actual selling prices. To figure out Jane's education portion of her property tax bill, the tax rate of $1.47.8 is divided by the CLA of 94.99%, then multiplied by the assessed value of the house divided by 100, because the tax rate is applied per $100 of value. So, her education tax for the year was $3,910.11. Jane knows that's a pretty good deal for the education her kids get at BFA. But what she can't figure out is why her brother, Dick, who lives a couple miles away on Lake Road and whose kids also go to BFA, paid less in education taxes, even though their house is assessed at a higher value than hers. It's assessed at $258,400. The answer is that Dick lives in St. Albans Town, which had a different CLA.
So after dividing the $1.47.8 district tax rate by the town COA of 103.86% and multiplying by his $258,400 assessment divided by 100, his tax bill was $3,677.21. Vic and Jay know that some people pay education taxes based on income and not property value, like their parents, Barbara and Harold, who recently retired and still live in the home where they raised their kids in Fairfield. Unlike Jane or Dick and their partners, Barbara and Harold are on a fixed income that falls below the household income threshold established by law. So their tax calculation works differently. Their total household income, pensions and social security was $82,275 below the state's household income threshold of $141,000. So they qualified for a homestead tax adjustment. The base tax rate for the income sensitivity program is 2% of income. Like the property value yield we talked about for Jane, there's also an income yield. And the tax rate still depends on what a district spends per equalized pupil. In fiscal year 2018, the income yield was $11,099. So the Maple Run Unified School District per pupil spending of $15,016.91 was 25.24% above the yield. Thus, the base rate of 2% of income was increased by the same percentage and resulted in a rate of 2.505% of income. So Barbara and Harold's tax liability is $2,060.99. With their assessed value of $325,600 and Fairfield CLA of 94.81%, Barbara and Harold's tax calculation based on property value was $5,075.80. Their annual tax bill was adjusted by $3,014.81 to reflect their income-based tax obligation of $2,060.99. When looking at how these formulas get applied in your district, remember that roughly 65% of homestead property owners pay state education taxes based on their household incomes rather than their property value. You might want to check out whether your own household qualifies. Finally, let's look at the impact on second homeowners and businesses who are taxed at the non-residential rate. Barbara and Harold's friends, Sally and Tim, moved south when they retired but they bought a camp right on St. Albans Bay so they would still have their connection to Vermont, their family, and their old friends. Their four-acre camp is right on the lake. I am pausing that because I'm not sure why. I guess it's just another ad. Flor, do you want me to keep going with the rest of it? Or do you? Yeah, I, I think let's move to the rest of the presentation and see people have questions. What do you think? Oh, it's back. Okay. Well, no, that's just my slide. Okay, let's just, yeah, let's, let's keep going. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I guess we should have checked the video all the way through to the end. They have inserted some ads. Um, we include that because it's a good overview, because our funding system is complex. Um, the concepts are still the same. The only thing that was, go the rest of that video is really just about second property and how they second property owners and how those they are taxed. So um, I think the board probably has enough information about how it's calculated, which is the most important part. Um, so we'll move into just talking about our budget design process, um, starting with the timeline, which the board has um, looked at and approved, but we'll try to explain what each one of these pieces are um, or is. Uh, tonight is a training and um, budget assumption affirmation, really, because you discussed this at your meeting last month. Um, but again, this year we are trying to give you a little bit more information at a high level about where the budget sits based on our assumptions. Um, and, and assumptions meaning the um, things that, that we are currently doing, what would it cost to do them next year? Um, our community, forum meeting is scheduled for November 1st. So that is an opportunity for public input. Um, we usually call that connecting our vision with budget realities, um, some version of that title. So that's an opportunity for us to hear from the community. Um, we also send budget surveys out. We will use Thought Exchange to do that this year since we have um, access to that platform. The first draft budget will be presented to the board on November 15th. That is the, um, the budget that is the administration's recommendation for how to um, implement the parameters that the board has given us. 
Um, and that will have estimates for salary benefits, estimated revenue um, based on what we know. The board will discuss. There will be another budget meeting on the 20th. If the board had asked for changes or if there is new information, we would be including that as part of that presentation. Again, the board will discuss. And on January 17th is the final budget meeting. And the goal is to have a final budget for approval by the board and warning on January 17th to have that in time for um, voting on March 4th and 5th. So fourth is the town is the annual meeting, and obviously March fifth is the town meeting day when you vote. And then the next two slides, um, Floor talked about this a little bit in the beginning, but um, our budget is given to us to be able to achieve our mission and our vision for students. So this is the Washington Central mission. We exist to nurture and inspire in all students the passion, creativity, and power to contribute to their local and global communities. And as you know, um, even though this is in draft form and we're in the process of updating it based on input, this, these are our initial core beliefs that um, are being developed as part of our strategic plan. So once we have a strategic plan and action steps, that is part of what the board will have to take into consideration when they um, approve the resources that the district will have in order to achieve this. Um, this next slide is meant to illustrate how we look at the budget and how we look at budget decisions once we have board direction and we have to develop a budget to match that direction. These are the three things that we look at together. Um, one of them is education quality, and that is um, what do we need to be able to provide a quality education to students? And that includes the education quality standards um, and just general evidence-based practices. We look at the extent to which we're equitably distributing our resources. So are we distributing our resources according to where our students are? And the third, though, is are we also taking into account student needs? So are there um, are the needs of our communities variable and are we adjusting? So we really look at all three of those things together. Those are lenses, not not any one of them drives the discussion. All three of them do. And I think that's I think that's pretty important and answers some of the questions that often come up, right? The tension between equity and um, student need and things like that. We really look at them all together. I'm gonna um, flip to the next slide and turn it over to Suzanne. She has the next several and um, she's gonna talk a little bit about um, some information that you'll see throughout the budget process in the context of our own numbers. Thanks, Megan. I just want it noted that that video is so much funnier in person, but wait, there's more. It's, it's very exciting in person, so. I... <laughs> um, now that we have an overview of Vermont's education funding system, we want to apply it to Washington Central. So this slide illustrates the comparison between the prior year budget to the current year budget, so FY23 to 24. The expenditures are the amount the district plans to spend. The revenues are the amount the district anticipates receiving to offset expenditures. And then the net education spending is the amount that needs to be raised by state and local property taxes augmented by other ed fund revenues. Next slide, please. Uh, next, we review the change in equalized pupils and the overall impact it has on local education spending per equalized pupil. We know that the equalized pupil number is a two-year average of the district's average daily enrollment, or ADM, <clears throat> adjusted by several factors for pre-K, secondary students, students in poverty, and limited English proficiency. The FY24-25 pupil count will be based on the long-term weighted average daily membership calculation, which I'll dive deeper into a little bit later. Uh, in FY24, equalized pupils decreased from 1,412.82 to 1,376.82, or 2.55%. This combined with the increase in net education spending resulted in an increase of $2,622 in local education spending per equalized pupil or an increase of 12.86%. <clears throat> the local education spending per equalized pupil is what determines the equalized tax rate. So yes, you can switch the next slide. <laughs> 
Here we see the year over year change in the common level of appraisal for each town in the district. Uh, it's important to remember that the CLA is a comparison of each town's total property value on the grand list versus the fair market value of properties. The higher the fair market value of properties in a town, the further under 100% the CLA will be. As the CLA decreases, the tax rate increases. This is how the state provides taxpayers with an equalized grand list across the state. The district saw decreases ranging between 5.19% and 8.95% with the most significant drops in Middlesex and Berlin. Next slide, please. Here we see the comparison of the individual ta uh, town tax rates from 23 to 24 after the change in the CLA. Factors used to develop the tax rate projections were equalized pupils at 1376.82, a property yield of 15,443, an equalized tax rate of 1.4908. Uh, 15,443 property yield was the final property yield set during last year's legislative session. It's important to know that this number is not officially set by the legislature until after town meeting. The property yield estimate used to develop the FY23 budget was $15,479, which means the final tax rates are actually slightly higher than the anticipated. In December, the tax commissioner will provide us with a forecasted property yield to use in estimates for the FY25 budget. Each town started with an equalized tax rate of 1.4908 and an equalized tax rate decrease of about 0.04. As we saw earlier in the video, the local common level of appraisal affects the actual tax rate, which is why the amounts differ by town. Long-term weighted average daily membership is replacing equalized pupils in FY24-25. Uh, it's Act 127 legislation that's taking effect. Um, Vermont will change weights add new categories and use the long-term weighted ADM counts instead of equalized pupils to calculate the tax rate in FY25. Uh, so what is long-term weighted average daily membership and how does it compare to equalized pupils? Uh, long-term weighted average daily membership is the two-year average of long-term average daily membership plus state place students plus all applicable weights. Uh, LTW ADM changes the categories and weights of students for calculating education spending per equalized pupil. The new categories use differing pupil bases, grade level, long-term membership, poverty, free and reduced lunch counts, and household income forms reporting families at or below 185% of the FPL, Sparsity or population density, population density, people per square mile applied to the long-term ADM. Districts with small schools, two-year average enrollment of a small school. English language learners or ELL count. What is local spending per average daily membership? And how does it compare to local spending per equalized pupil? Starting in FY25, LTW ADM will determine the equalized tax rate. If everything remained the same, including the yield, then the FY24 district tax rate would have been 94 cents instead of 1.4908. Finally, the FY24 spending or long-term weighted average daily membership will be compared to the FY25 spending LTW ADM. If the district increases the spending per pupil by more than 10%, the tax rate will be subject to review by a committee. We will all continue to learn more about the impact of this change on the tax rate as we progress through the budget process. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, I'm gonna keep going through, but obviously we will have time for questions. It's just easier to do questions when I, we can see all your faces. Um, the only thing I would add to that is that um, the, the change in weights um, are going to impact us, I would say, more favorably than we originally thought based on estimates that we were given last year. Um, that does not affect our expense side of things, but it does affect our ultimate tax rate. Um, so you'll you'll see a little bit more about that. But um, so budget realities. 
These are things that the board has seen last year. Some of them are actually happening this year. You saw a preview of them last year. Um, one of them is that, as you know, this is the last year of ARP ESSER funds. Um, so that will be a big conversation um, as part of the budget. There are two changes in education funding um, that's increasingly tie, uh, tie things to enrollment. Um, one is Act 127, where we will have increased long-term weighted pupils. So that's what Suzanne was just going over. That one works in our favor. Um, in Act 173, which is special education funding, um, as our enrollment declines, our special education revenue will decline because special education is not based on equal or long-term weighted pupils. It's based on ADM, actual enrollment. Um, there continue to be federal grant impacts, um, partially because um, as the costs of our labor go up, and our grants stay the same, our grants will pay for fewer of our staff. Um, and that's just a reality, even if the grants as a dollar amount stay the same. Um, we just talked about in declining enrollment and then just things that come out of our strategic planning process. Um, we will need resources to achieve um, what gets put in our strategic plan. This is a graph that we've showed the board um, a few different, uh, during most of our budget trainings, you will see enrollment data in multiple different formats. Tonight is not meant to be an exhaustive um, look through, but this grant, this graph illustrates just our overall decline in enrollment um, over the past five years. Um, previewing data you'll see uh, in later meetings, um, you know, we are projected to decline at least for the next five years um, before we level off as a district. These are the budget parameters that the board discussed last year, uh, last year, last month, mass meeting, sorry. Um, and this is what, this is the direction that you give us as a leadership team so that we can bring you a budget proposal that um, matches these to the extent that we can. Um, I won't read through them because you're familiar with them. The only thing that we did add, um, you know, the board has had a parameter for a number of years to keep, uh, to keep our, um, spending under this, what used to be the spending threshold, um, even though that doesn't exist. And Suzanne and I both wondered if the board, in some ways, we now have a new spending threshold. It's very differently calculated. Um, but Act 127 would require a tax rate review if if it was in exceeded um, 10 percent. That would actually be harder for us not to meet, um, we think, but we that may be something the board wants to use instead of the spending threshold, which is continues to be suspended. And then I'm going to turn to Suzanne. This is the information that we wanted to share early in the process with you. Yeah, we have a projected local education spending uh, currently at $35,782,907. Uh, um, there are still several things that we don't know. We haven't finalized all the salaries for FY25. Health insurance rate increases are not finalized. Uh, currently projecting a 15% increase as a placeholder based on uh, information from our health insurance provider. Uh, revenues are not finalized. We won't have the property yield until December 1. So there's still a lot of moving parts, but we wanted to give you uh, as early of a picture as we could see based on um, the ARP ESSER grants ending and moving uh, all the staff into the general fund for that purpose um, to pay for those. Um, it, it amounts to a $4 million $85,668 increase, um, which is a 12.89% increase. 1% uh, of our FY24 budget is equal to $316,972. That's just a nice number to keep in mind, and it helps you think about, um, you know, as we try to move that percent ticker uh, need, and there's a $3 million, 134 $3,134,751 needed to reduce uh, to achieve that 3% increase in local education spending. And 3% is what we plugged in here 
uh, based on that possible use of an October inflation rate, but even October's inflation rate is not yet known. So that's a placeholder again. Thanks, Suzanne. And again, this is meant to give the board perspective the parameter around um, the October inflation rate. Uh, these are numbers that we spoke to last year and wanted to be really specific earlier. Um, so to say it differently, if the administration was to bring in a budget at that October or at that 3%, um, it would be just over a $3 million reduction in the budget. So that is what we have to share with you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, I'm sure there are questions, but it's easier to field when I can see you. Any questions from board members? Kari. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So just to clarify, the 12.89% projection is based on current um, staffing levels and expense projections based on what we understand right now. We're yes, not using thank you. Of service, but, but that's but exactly that, right. That is as if we do had all the staff, all the things, all, all the materials that we have right now next year. That's what it would cost estimated. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Chris? Um, hi, Megan and, and Suzanne. Thanks for the information. Um, what is the um, dollar value for the staff members that we hired with the ESSER funds uh, that is being um, pulled into the general budget? I believe it is around 579000 Suzanne can confirm. Got it. Okay, thank you. Daniel. Uh, yeah, how does this baseline budget increase in expense, the 12.89% compared to last year's equivalent that what we used to call the level service budget how does what was that increase i don't recall it was just under 10 percent. i think it was like nine eight five thank you our final increase was around 12 though chris is your hand up again or is just um, the leftover no i'm taking it down Okay. I couldn't find the uh, it's okay. It's okay. Any other questions before we move into our student report? Diane? Uh, just appreciation to uh, really making it very clear uh, what that cut is potentially that that's, that's where, you know, my math tripped me up last year. So it's very helpful to see that clearly um, as to what the reality is that we're looking at um, in this discussion. Thanks, Diane. McKaylin? Um, can you just say one more time that um, that 10% thing that was loaded, can you just say that again? And then how how does that compare to the then 3% thing you estimated at the end? I'll take a step. I think that's, I, I might be hearing this as two different things. So the 10% is that yeah, under Act 127, it increases uh, more Megan, than 10. You're breaking up quite a bit, Megan. Then we're subject to a tax rate review. Have that right? Megan, you're breaking up a little bit. Maybe Suzanne. Yeah, Thank I'll you. just try to fill in some of those holes yeah. that she had there. Yeah. yeah. Um, the long-term weighted average daily membership, uh, the, the spending per long-term weighted average daily membership will be measured this year's against what it would have been last year. So that $14,510 per pupil, we'll come up with whatever this year's is 
compare it, if it is over 10%, then we're subject to a tax rate review uh, by a committee that is not yet formed of, uh, I believe, superintendents and business managers and some other folks will be on that committee. But um, we'd have to justify the reasoning for that tax rate increase going above 10%. And then the okay, 3% is based on um, the the budget or the board's parameter of possibly using October inflation, which is running at around 3% right now. So we use 3% as a placeholder for now. We won't know October's inflation number until November. And, and um, yeah, that's it. Right, and then that 10% that thing, we don't know yet either because that hasn't been calculated yet. Right. We don't know our pupils for that. That's that's another piece that we're not we're we don't currently have for this year. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chris. Yeah. Um uh, so uh, two things. One is uh, Megan, you were talking about the the ten percent uh review. Um is the new formulation uh likely that we will not approach that or that we will approach that? And then the second question is, in, in the declining um, enrollment numbers that, that showed on the graph, are we able to get that over time as opposed to, I think that was a 10-year look back, uh, and how that translates into specific numbers for each school? Sure. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, the answer is we, you're correct. We don't think that we would hit that 10% threshold because where uh, it's favorable, Act 127 is favorable to us from an enrollment standpoint. Um, so we don't think we will fail that test, so to speak. Um, and then, yes, we do have the ability to show um, the enrollment data differently, um, including by school in the next budget okay. presentation. Okay, great. Megan, can I add just a little bit to that? I feel like we can't really state for sure that we won't hit that because we don't know what this year's long-term weighted average daily membership is. And if you take a, an increased budget and you divide it by a lower pupil count, because we know it will be, will likely be lower because our enrollment is lower. Um, right now we would be looking at a, a higher percentage if we use this number. Ursula? Uh, I was hoping, Suzanne, do you know when we will know our long-term weighted student number? I don't know. I'm hoping it'll be soon. Usually I get equalized pupils. That's one of the first data points I get. So I, I'm thinking they'll get that one out November. Thank you. Daniel? Just to ask that we receive those slides by email if possible. Yeah, you will get, you will get a copy and they will be posted online too. Thank you, Daniel. Um, any other questions? Otherwise, we're going to move into our students re student report. Willow and Lina, are you still here with us? Oh, they're coming in again. They. Cyberspace is bringing them in. We see Steven and hopefully they will operate in one second. They're there. Go ahead. The floor is yours, Willow and Linnea. There. Okay, sorry. A couple of malfunctions. Let's, we're going to get our um, document up to do this. Can you guys hear us? We can't see you right now. So yes, just we can, we can hear down. you perfectly yeah. and we can see you too. So. I don't hear anyone. <laughs> oh, no, we can hear you. Okay, okay, okay sweet. Okay, so hi, everyone. Glad everyone's doing well. Um, So this, these past, since the last meeting, though, a lot's happened. Um, the So today, the conversation, which is a group mostly led by Alice Lamb, who works as an intern at the Mosaic, and we did a presentation about consent to the middle schoolers. It was great. They were interactive. Everyone had their voice. And it was pretty cool to just see what people thought consent was and then see 
how much they learned after it. Um, these meetings and presentations were going to be happening in a couple of weeks to different <laughs> middle school groups. Um, some of the students at U32 put, well, some female students at U32 put period posters in the bathrooms. And it's just talking about like how like your period can be hurtful, but how it's not supposed to harm too much. Just like kind of just general information that we wouldn't really get otherwise, which is interesting. So word of mouth is back. Last year it was read or it was led by Jasmine. And basically word of mouth is a independent original piece performance showcase kind of thing where students can perform or speak. So poetry, songwriting, music, creating anything in, in art and or like even comedy. And myself and two other students are bringing it back so we can have it this year. And we will be performing November, I think, 21st. And it's in the, we've put up a whole bunch of posters and people are here to sign up and we've already got feedback from it. So I think it's going to be pretty exciting and pretty big this year. So we'll have two. So if kids don't want to sign up this time or get inspired, they will be able to. Um, for sports this past couple weeks, um, field hockey and football had a combined practice the other day. Um, we were just like field hockey was kicking like we're punting and then we were trying to catch them and football was shooting on some of the goalies. Um, cross, cross country went to New York City to compete in the Manhattan, Manhattan Invitational. Um, and there's been some soccer games and other stuff like that um, that didn't go too well. But <laughs> <laughs> so the girl soccer has officially been defeated. Um, we played against Harwood last night and sadly lost. Harwood's a great team. They played extremely well and it wasn't our game. There was some controversial things, but we needed to get into a new groove and we have our end of our season game Friday. And then we also had our senior nights. Yes, senior night. Um, field hockey won, I think, 9-0. Um, I think pretty much all of the teams won on senior night. Um, it was pretty successful. There was good student turnout. It was fun. They were good games. Yeah, a lot of people showed up for all the sports, which was really nice to mm -hmm. see. And there was a lot of participation in the student sections and just supporting each other. So the theater is performing Peter and the Starcatcher, and the rumor is that they have to be off book by Saturday. So that's stressful, I'm sure, for them. Um, but it should be the show, I believe, is going to take place the 1st and 2nd of November. And 3rd. 3rd. Oh, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, I think. Yeah. So everyone should definitely show up for that. We're going to try to get a lot of student participation in that as well. <laughs> um, normal seasons are coming to an end for everybody and playoffs are coming up so I know football's in the rankings I think everybody is I know soccer definitely is for boys and girls field hockey we are seed we are placed in fourth so yeah looking good for sports yeah and then the most important thing that I think needs to be said is tomorrow is Thursday but also tomorrow is the most important day for lunch because it's brunch for lunch. Students are hyped. Students are ready to just absolutely devour some French toast sticks, a hash brown, some eggs, and a sausage. And just that is what makes school lunch the best. Students love brunch for lunch. I know I'm excited. I know a lot of people are excited. So that is the most important piece of information we have for you tonight, but you guys should all come to lunch tomorrow and get some brunch for lunch. It's top tier. That's all we have for you guys today. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Elena and Will. Thank you so much. Uh, any questions from board members after all of those highlights? It's pretty exciting. Jonathan. Yeah, I'm just curious to know how it went uh, for cross country in Manhattan. <laughs> We think well. We are assuming well. Cross country always does very well. Um, yeah, 
I haven't really heard too much about it. They don't really have a. I heard the time. trip was fun. I didn't really hear about the stats, but I know a lot of the students really had a lot of fun, like hanging out together. And I saw a lot of photos posted and everyone seemed like they were, had like a great time. So I think it was an overall successful trip, but statistics, I assume they did well. Um, they but usually, they usually, usually do, do very well. well. <laughs> so we don't know. Any other questions from uh, Jonathan? What I can say, my I thought my kids have graduated from that program, but their Instagram account was they did great. So for cross country. Uh, okay. Any other questions besides thanks and appreciation for your report? I hope that you guys are staying with us. And we're gonna uh, move on into the superintendent and central office and to the cult report. Uh, any sure. highlights that you want to share with us, Megan, or any specific questions that board members want to answer, please go ahead. Go ahead, Megan. Yeah, the only thing I was going to highlight is just connecting the, I talked a little bit about a grant funding opportunity that we are seeking called Project Serve, um, specifically to support Berlin. Um, there's a little bit of information there about what that grant funding is. Um, it's connected to a personnel action that is later in the agenda, and I just wanted to make that connection for you. Um, and I did just hear back from Project Serve. Um, it, they have a couple of tweaks to our application to send it back out, so it's moving through the process. Um, and happy to answer questions about that or anything else. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Are you trying to raise your hand? There you go. Go ahead, Chris. Thanks. Hey, Megan, is the personnel matter that's later in the agenda connected uh, or contingent upon Project Serve or separate? Does it need to be done regardless of Project Serve? We would like the board to take action on it either way. We think it's an important enough resource that we would be brainstorming other grant funds if Project Serve doesn't work out. Um, we would yeah. look to fund it through grants, um, but it allows us to start posting as anticipated. So we would like you to take mm -hmm. action either way. That'd be our preference. Thank you. Any any other questions for for Megan? Uh, you know, I, I, have another, I have another question. Go ahead. Um, just hold I'm on sorry, one minute, Chris. Okay, any any other question from any other board members before so that we I don't see any hands up. Go ahead, Chris. Okay. Um, um in in response to Brian's um public comment, I didn't see anything in the agenda about a food service vote or anything like that. Is there? No, nope, because this is a, a, a update from the finance committee meeting, a preliminary, it's essentially looking to see if it is even a viable discussion to have. Um, so before okay, doing you. the legwork to have a discussion and bring appropriate information, it's does this even make sense? That's what the exploratory sure. um, nature of it was. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions for for Megan, otherwise, let's move into the principal's report. And principal's report is really, if you all have questions, I will field them to my principals. Otherwise, it is there so that you have a little peek into what's happening in the buildings. I almost feel like I have to start with a protocol. Like, what did you notice? <laughs> what are you wondering about? Because <laughs> so, uh, if it's a lot of information that they share with us, and I, you know, I, I think we also, for the principals, don't feel like because we don't ask questions is not appreciated because we really love it. And I continue to say that I love how I continue to see the alignment and the change in how we update in, you know, student, uh, especially in the humanities and justice, how that has grown and aligned in some ways across our district it looks really it's exciting so uh, so thank you uh, ursula do you have a question right comment? i didn't have a question i'll make a comment that in because they had the academic section and they talked about some changes 
to assessment methods and whatnot in response to needs. And I really appreciated reading that. Thank you, Ursula. Yeah, so now we move to the Central Vermont uh, Career Center report. Uh, we just had our meeting on, on Monday. We are working on budget right now. Uh, two highlights to share from, from, uh, from the Career Center right now as we continue to work in having the uh, full day uh, for next uh, for next year and second all of that advisory committees met uh, this this Monday which means that every advisory committee to all of the programs meet uh, they start at three o'clock and you can visit all of them but it's like a roundtable discussion and each individual meets and then the the board meets after that we continue to work in our facilities uh, too so the facilities committee had a had a report we just added two members to our facility a committee to continue to figure out how best we're going to be able to serve the needs across a, our six sending a, districts in the existing facilities or on a future facility. A, so all of the committees worked in, on their a, SMART goals for that. A, any questions on that? A, Chris, I'm assuming that's an all hand or is that a new hand? Oh, hon. Okay. The next one is the DSBA update. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. Uh, the board members that are attending, just a reminder, even if you're not the voting member. Lord, to register. Yeah. It's a new, it's an, it was actually a new hand. And I was oh, wondering sorry, if there's sorry, any I discussion. Thought... Yeah. Is there any discussion about the mechanism of voting for the um, career, career center budget? Um, because of, remember we had that kind of by two part voting process last year where it wasn't you had to send it out separately yeah we that's going to continue to be the same way the our ballots because uh, unless we have we we did not discuss this at our last uh, meeting but we would have to get all our 18 towns to send their ballots with their um with their school ballots and not all of the okay. towns send their ballots with their uh, even mail their ballots at all so, so they are two. They're two separate districts, and they right. they will continue okay. to be. So, there's been some talk about doing a a special line or something different on that ballot, but we'll have more information closer to to that. But thank you for thinking okay. about that. Uh, the VSBA yeah. update. So please, uh, there's a little link on the update that you get every Tuesday. But if you just go to the website, there's a place there of the annual meeting where you can register to participate in the annual meeting. Even if you're not the voting member, it's great to participate in the annual meeting. You just you don't vote, but you can be part of the annual meeting and see uh, talk about the resolutions. The second one in that same update, we added a little piece where it says NSBA is having a rural summit. It's a free event. So the National School Boards Association is having a free event and it's related to actually, Kari, you had asked about this a while ago, which is why I put this here. This is a, a free summit. You can uh, sign up for it. It's for across the country and it's pretty much resources and empowering rural communities. It's December 13th from one to 4 p.m. And it's just a good way to see what's going across the country and you know how we compare to others and I don't know it's it's a good way to learn too so I wanted to highlight that in case you missed it and November 14 there's a webinar on tax rates and budgets so if you it's at noon if you can't make it just register for it you will get all the information and you can see it at a later date those were the three little things I wanted to update on that you guys get the newsletter read it when you can <laughs> Okay, let's move to you, Ursula, education quality. I'll stop talking. On page 14 is our memo to you, the full board on our most recent um, data report. We're supposed to come to you four times a year with different um, achievement monitoring data reports. And this is the first one. It was our spring 2023 data. And we gave you our purpose and charge, how we're doing. We gave you some definitions to help the report, which had some graphs in it. There was also a link that went to our full presentation that came to the committee that you could go check out. We had a summary of our analysis that started on page 16. 
And then we wanted to get into at this meeting, having a discussion about the report. This is our hope is to bring you a consistent report format, similar to the cool report, similar to the principal report. I'm um, bringing you a report in a consistent format so you know what to find and where. And this is our first attempt and we want to get some feedback. So we have some guiding questions and the first one is what stands out to you in the report? Raise your hand and we'll be happy to call on you. Kari. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, two things jump out at me. One is that um, proficiency levels are lower than we would like them to be um, in both areas, especially for the uh, students on IEP. But on the positive side, there is some pretty solid growth uh, performance. And I think the stretch growth, if you remember that, um, is particularly impressive. So that, that is encouraging. Chris. Um, hi, Ursula. Thank you very much. Um, I like the format of the report and uh, the definitions because it helps understand what, what I'm reading. Um, is there any, um, based on this report and the findings, is there any input from the administration on what might be done differently to address, um, to help improve on the, our strengths, but also to address any weaknesses? So having uh, like any linkage between uh, result and potential future action, I think would be great as well, if if there is that information. Uh, and then I just have a couple questions about the change in the uh, instructional um, and evaluation practices. Um, what Are you looking change... under the changes? I am. I'm yep. looking at page 16. And I'm wondering if the changes in the evaluation practice uh, change the ability to rely upon past results that were uh, gotten under a different evaluation process and whether you can rely upon those to continue into the future. And I'm just trying to see yeah. how you transition from one to the other. So Thank this you. is our baseline. Like we said up above, this year is going to act as our baseline based on those goals that were set and stated up in the yep. purpose and charge. And so because we used different evaluation methods, right? We had the SBAC, we had different evaluation methods and they have been changed. This is our base goal and moving forward, we, be, we will be able to compare spring 2023 to spring 2024 and beyond. Does that make sense? So it absolutely does. But does it, is there any linkage then to the old evaluative data that we have? I'm using the I, other evaluation tools. So this would be for Jen or Megan maybe to answer. I think it's a really big lift work-wise from my opinion, like knowing how information and numbers work. They're going to have to correlate those old evaluation methods to a different local evaluation and then try to see how that fits with the new ones. So I don't know whether Megan, and I know Jen snuck into the meeting and whether she wants to speak to it. I can speak a little bit to it. So for our local assessments, um, one of the, especially in the area of reading, we've made such significant uh, revisions to our literacy performance indicators based on newer research and evidence in the field that it would be, it would not be comparing apples to apples. So that doesn't necessarily make sense. We do have some previous data from iReady, and in fact, the leadership team was just engaged in a study of looking at some past data in the past for fall um, iReady data to, to figure out for your next report the, uh, for the Ed Quality Committee, how to start building that longitudinal foundation. And I would say what I've heard for the AO, from the AOE is they're, they're working on trying to figure out if there is any way to kind of make sense of the new VCAP scores uh, based on sort of SBAC stuff. But that is, uh, that is just a beginning process as far as I know. I haven't seen that there's anything definitive that can happen. If and when there is, we are happy to include that information for you all in future reports. Thank you. Healy. 
Great. Thanks for this. Um, it's really helpful to see. And I'm wondering, and it it's probably just because it's a baseline and maybe we'll get this a little bit later, but being new, I don't really know what I'm looking at in the graphs, whether this is good or what our goals are, or what our targets are. So, you know, when I got to the point where it said for stretch growth, we're more than the national average, I found that really helpful as as context. So if we could, um, you know, if you could add something like that in, in the in the future, that would be really helpful just to understand the context around the numbers. Thank you. Anyone else? So our next question is, what questions do you have about our analysis about the data? Some of those came up already. You can raise your hands, just jump in. Our third question is, do you agree with the analysis that we made? So we're talking the statements that were made on page 16 and 17 of the packet. Next question would be, what other implications for the full board do you see? We had a section that talked on implications for the school board, such as informed oversight, and then ensuring that we're allocating our resources to continuing to build and implement our local comprehensive assessment system. Are there other implications that anybody else on the board sees? Kari? One I would add is that our guidance, excuse me, to the administration about closing the achievement gap. I think we want to maintain that as a priority for long enough to see significant improvement. I think the goal that's been set is great, but we want to move beyond that. And these things take time, obviously. So we just want to keep this um, area of focus on our radar for a good long time, in my opinion. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Chris. Yeah, so could we um, ask the administration to um, identify what additional resources, if any, they would need in order to um, achieve our goals for student achievement? My hope is, yeah, I guess my hope is that that would come to us in their recommendation for the budget that we'll see in okay, so November, right? That's the yeah. hope. What? Um, but having it, but. But having having it specifically, I said yes, that's the hope. Um, but having it specifically identified, saying with this um, result, we we think we need these types of resources to achieve that goal. I, I appreciate it, I, your input. Oh, okay. yeah, floor. I, I, I think I think Chris that we are our our purpose was when we were at, at that meeting that that second bullet has to ensure that when we're allocating resources to continue to build and implement on the local comprehensive assessment, including resources, oh, you're right, it doesn't get all of it. Yeah. So. Hmm. Well, I'll, I'll just say that that was the purpose of establishing that, the, that initial yeah. budget parameter was yeah. to say, we want you to propose something to us, develop something, yeah. and let's include it in the budget. That was that was expressly the purpose of that, Chris. Yeah, of that of okay. that parameter, but I'm wondering if we put it here too as a third bullet, but I, it's not really related to the, it, it is related, but on I, I, I don't know. I'm trying to like sort of bring together what Chris was asking and- So I guess my question is, is, Chris, are you looking for them to tell you like the specific programs and exact assessment not, methods that they plan to use or? Not as much exactitude, but if they have a certain thing in mind and say that, that they, you just let us, let us know if they need more resources um, for a particular type of achievement. That's what I'm looking for. Just that we, we hope the administration will be um, frank enough to say this is what we need um, to achieve to try and achieve this goal that the the data is telling us we should be achieving. I'm just taking notes. Thanks so much. 
Anyone else? Any other format comments? Yeah, one, one other on format. Um, I, I think I mentioned this before, but if we could add the the disaggregated graph equivalents, um, that would be helpful, especially in monitoring the second part of the goal that we're going to see an overall percentage of students who are proficient increase by 10%. We'll need to see the disaggregated for that. Disaggregated by... So the, the two sets of graphs that have been presented are re, um, by FRL, free and reduced lunch, and by IEP eligibility. But I think we want to see it for all students with, without those breakdowns, if that makes sense. So a third, a third pair. Like a total of, I'm just trying to understand, like you want because right now those graphs show IEP students against non-IEP students or free and reduced versus non-free and reduced. You want a graph item that has a total? Oh, uh, yeah, overall. The, the overall students. Yeah, but yes, because I think that's what the goal talks about, increasing the overall percentage of students who are proficient by 10%. And also reducing the gap between by 10%. Exactly. There's two, two parts to that goal. And Kari, you said that you referred to that as the second goal, just so that I can capture it. The it's second important. part of the goal. Okay, There's thanks. Two, second two part elements. of the goal. Second Thank part, you. yeah. Anybody else? I appreciate everybody's input. And I appreciate the ed, ed quality members that meet to discuss this in detail. Well, we appreciate you, Ursula. Thank you for leading this. And, uh, if, you know, just for the public that is here, there's a lot of the board members that participate in the quality. So that's probably why there's a little less discussion <laughs> here. Let's move into the finance, uh, the finance committee discussion and I am going to look for a motion. It's on page 18 uh, for the capital improvement projects update and approval. Go ahead, Ursula. I move that the board authorize the allocation of $127,502 additional capital reserve funds to the complete board funds to the completion of the projects as identified above and approved the district moving forward with bid document and bidding as necessary. Thank you, Ursula. Could I have a second? And then we'll have thank you. thank you, Daniel. Okay. Now any questions and discussion, board members, for you that are just seeing it now. Hey, I don't see any questions from any board members. The table is pretty self-explanatory, so thank you for reading the packet. All of those in favor of approving the motion as read by Ursula and second by Daniel, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any oppose? Any abstain? Okay, seeing none, the motion carries. Okay, moving back to, oh, sorry, I'm in my digital thing uh, in page 21 uh, award the exterior doors the bid for u32 i'm looking for a motion to i move that we so. award oh, the go, go ahead chris okay award the bid um in the amount of 117,000 not to exceed 117,254 dollars for the U32 exterior door replacement project to Acme Glass to be completed in FY 2023-2024. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Thank a you. second. Thank you, Daniel. Any discussion? Any questions? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Aye. Aye. Aye. Aye. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstain? Seeing none, the motion carries. Thank you. Uh, and now the dental premiums, uh, 6.3. I'm looking for a motion to approve the dental premiums for for year 25, Ursula. I move that the board set the calendar year 2024 dental insurance premiums as follows. Single plan, $720. Two-person plan, $1,080. Family plan, $1,680. Did I have a second? Second. Thank you, Seth. All those in favor, oh, any questions? Daniel? Just wanted to declare a conflict of interest uh, as my family pays these premiums, so I will be abstaining from the vote. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And one um, uh, abstain, just you, Daniel. Yeah. Thank you for declaring your conflict of interest. It's appreciated. Okay. Moving right along. Oh, it's back to me. Update from the configuration study. So the configuration study, so it takes me a minute in the digital thing to go back and forth. The configuration study committee met just right before this uh, meeting, and they wanted, uh, they wanted to share three things uh, with you. We looked at the data uh, that was in our in, in the packet, which is available for, for everybody, and uh, we used the protocol to analyze the data, what we what were uh, what did we notice and what we were wondering on after looking at the data? And then the last thing that, uh, that we're gonna move ahead and have a brainstorming session at our next uh, at our next meeting. And we asked for a little bit of extra data, but those were the three things that the committee wanted me to share with you. It was a really uh, good uh, meeting and the protocol worked really well. Uh, Jeannie Phillips was with us too, to help us facilitate the, the discussion. Uh, now I'm going to move right into the policy uh, committee. Wait, 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 Floor, I have a question. Yes. Um, you said the uh, the data was the data connected in this in this um, in the finance committee the packet. Oh well, okay. Yeah, yeah. in the finance um, committee packet. Okay. All right. Okay. Oh, okay. oh, okay. So it's not part of the board packet. No, no part of the board packet. No, part of okay, the finance thank you. Okay. packet. Yeah. Right. Okay. And so now you're on policy committee, Chris. Okay. Um, so the uh, memorandum uh, tells the truth that we had did have a robust discussion in our last policy committee. Um, and it, it was good, uh, and, and basically around the, uh, the library and instructional materials, uh, and the personnel recruitment, um, uh, policies, which are not yet up for, uh, the board's consideration, but will be in our next, uh, meeting. Uh, and, but we, what we do have for you today, uh, is a revision to the, uh, transportation, uh, uh, policy essentially adopting a lot of the VSBA model policy uh, and uh, modifying it not really much. Um, and so that's up for first reading for your consideration. Do we have any questions about C3, the transportation policy that we are presenting? Now, hearing none, we'll move on to uh, C6, which is uh, our, our home study students policy. Um, we again um, adopted the, or recommending that we adopt the VSBA poly, uh, model policy language um, in regard to our home study students. Um, I think our the policy that we already had in place, uh, or still have in place, is pretty close to what we got from the model, um, but we thought it, the model policy was more directive in 
uh, citing various statutory provisions. And so uh, we're recommending that we adopt it at, at hopefully our next meeting. Any questions about the home study student policy? Okay, that's it. Thank you. Daniel. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I, didn't see I was just curious about um, well, the 16 VSA subsection 166. I, I just was curious what what if any state laws apply to us in terms of making um, course enrollment and co-curriculars and so on available to home study students? I can give you a really quick overview. Um, in Vermont, home study students are allowed to access extracurriculars, so sports, um, the play, uh, things that kind of happen outside of school. Um, they also can access classes at school as long as their home study program is, um, I think it's 60% of their core academic classes have to be at home. And that's kind of to prevent people from, oh, I just homeschool my child in math, for example. It has to be the other way around. But um, we mm -hmm. would allow those students to take classes. Um, and that's at the elementary school or the high school. That's the quick version. Not required to just we we may actually, we may make these available. Actually, no, we have to in Vermont. Mm -hmm. We are obligated to give them access. Sorry, I might not have said that very clearly. If, if they're in our region, if, if they're, they're in, in our district, correct. Yep, we don't take home study students that don't. That's it's home study students that reside in our towns. Sorry, any other questions? Otherwise, we're going to move to our next uh, is the uh, board operations. Uh, we're in board vacancies. We wanted to have this uh, this discussion just to remind people so it's never early enough, but we have a little spreadsheet of people that need to run for the next. I think most of you are aware, but for Amelia, Kelly, and Zach, uh, you, uh, sorry, Daniel, do you have your hand up? Did I miss some? No, okay. Uh, you will be running uh, in 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 March, uh, which means that uh, you will be submitting all your paperwork in uh, in January. So just a reminder for that. But the other reason this is, and then there's a few of you. I'm just trying to open the. It's taking me a minute to open the uh, the spreadsheet. There's a couple others. I can't really see any others. So if you know that you have to run, eh, could you please let me raise your hand? Otherwise, this is an opportunity for us to talk about the, the future. If there's any that any of you that is not planning to run for the next in 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 March, so that we can start planning. Carrie. Yeah, my, my seat is coming up and I will not be running again. Thank you, Kari. Chris? And I think my seat is coming up as well and I'm undecided. Thank you. Chris and Kari. All right. Okay. Uh, that was that that was it for that i would be reaching out to all of you to you know sort of help uh, recruit and it's never too early <laughs> to talk to others so if you're already thinking of not running please reach out and make up and let's make a plan to make sure that we have uh it, you know that we don't end up with a vacancy <laughs> as we start in march okay thank you um okay so moving into our next uh, a consent agenda. Oh my goodness. Let's approve the minutes for uh, October 4th, 2023, October 11th, there on page 28. Should I have a motion? Thank you, Ursula. Move to approve. Second. All right. Ursula moves it and Chris seconds it. Uh, any changes? Yeah, uh, a sec. 
Yeah, what I'd like to propose one small correction. Um, se second page of the minutes, you know, item five in the motion, I believe it should be the, you know, to, so to sign on behalf of U32 if requested rather than as. Okay, thank you. Any other changes? Ursula and uh, and Chris, you're okay with that small? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Any abstain? The minutes are approved. And now I need a volunteer that we don't have, Lindy, to approve our board orders. And I know all of you have them right in front of you. Diane is smiling, so should I put it on you, Diane, or otherwise trust uh, trust that Ursula has it right in front of her or Kelly? No, I'm trying to read people. <laughs> that I Ursula have it open. Okay, thank you, Ursula. I move that we approve the board orders for September 21st through October 18th in the total amount of. $828,764.34. Second. Thank you, Diane. And thank you, Ursula. And thank you, Diane. Any questions? Any discussion? All right. All those in favor of approving the board orders, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, I will be sending you an email after this meeting. Please reply, not, you know, not reply, send your, uh, and for the new board members, there'll be instructions there. And it's just approving the, the board orders via email and we'll copy um, Melissa. Uh, so she, we need at least eight board members. Okay. Um, and now moving into personnel, approve new teachers and it's in page 32. Okay, don't all run up with your hand. Amelia, do you have it open? You want to do it? No. Okay. I can do it. Thank and you. then Amelia can second it if she'd like to. So that, um, that's perfect. <laughs> so I I move that we, um, ex of course, I don't even know what I'm saying, that we accept the new teacher, uh, Jen Donovan, interventionist point five for FY24 only. Second. I didn't realize I was muted. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> any questions? Although, otherwise, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. And welcome, Jen, to a new job. Um, and then I can also mention that we move to uh, accept Mahala Largent's resignation as the school nurse at U32 and wish her well. Thank you. Second. Second. Diane. All right. Second by Chris, right? Yeah. All yes. those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries, and that's the last of the personnel. And hold on. Let's move into the request for the grant fund on page 34. Could I have a motion and then we can have discussion? Um, I would move that we approve a budget amendment to add a 1.0 BCBA behavioral system specialist position pending funding. Second. Thank you. Michaela, that was you? That was Keely. Keely, sorry. Okay. I was looking down and missed it. <laughs> All right. Any, any questions? The memo was pretty clear, but... It's super exciting. I think it is a really good thing. <laughs> and 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 yeah. And then please come to us if we need to change the grant fund, you know, whatever it is, please. It's this is super exciting. 
to need it. So, although Daniel, I was just curious. Um, the terminology of the position, behavioral system specialist, is that terminology that we use in, in other schools? Like, do we have these positions in other schools? And the follow up question is, uh, do we have any vacancies in other schools currently, or are they all filled positions? Yep, good question. It is, we do have some similar positions in terms of the behavior system uh, specialist. We, however, because of the nature of the funding, this is a pretty specific uh, position to what Berlin needs, hence the BCBA. And honestly, we use the other language so that when we post, we can broaden our search to make sure we get lots of candidates. Um, so it's a little bit, yes, we have similar positions, but this one, um, particularly because of the funding source and the, the need that it's serving, really needs to be tied to impacted families who are now double impacted. Um, so it is it is defined pretty specifically for what they need. And no, uh, sorry, second part of your question, there are not vacancies in those positions in other buildings. And is the expectation, sorry, another one, um, that projects are funded for more than one year? Like, is it, is it going forward? So Project Serve is a 12 month, typically a 12 month funding source from the time that they fund it. So it would fund it through this year and through part of next year, give or take, depending on when we hired it. So in the budget conversation, if there's some gaps, we either would be talking to you about it from a budget standpoint, or we may be looking at some of those alternative methods of funding to get it through the end of next year. Because the goal is really to, to use it at least through the, through the end of next school year and then determine if we need it longer than that. So 12 months of funding comes from Project Serve. After that, either you'll hear from us in this budget season, because that's next year, um, or we would be looking at other grant funding. Thank you, Megan. And thank you, Daniel, for your question. Chris, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Uh, so Megan, the the, the memo um, in, in this part of the largest, well, two paragraphs on the bottom, uh, indicate that uh, the position would be serving um, students and their families, but then it also seems to expand it to to provide what to, what you say is school wide support and consultation to increase capacity for all students and teachers in the Berlin school community. Um, is this position needed more for directed services, or is it a, a or is it a combination of more global support as well? in Berlin? It's definitely directed and prioritized towards identified students and families. Um, it's just that when you bring a position and a professional of that caliber into a system, they typically also benefit class, you know, teachers, um, you know, they do benefit the rest of the school. But the primary goal, particularly in the beginning of the position, will be to wrap around identified students. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for the questions. All those in favor of approving the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Megan, I'm wondering if you want to share your screen, if by any chance you have it. Otherwise, I could, the work plan. I yeah. can share my screen. Yep, hold on. Give me a second. Or otherwise, I think I might have it right in front, or maybe not. I've got it. You got it. Okay. Yep. Oh, I got it. Thank you. Yep. All right. So, looking at November first, uh, and that this is our forum connecting our vision to our budget realities. And that's November 1st, and Ed Quality would be meeting on November 1st, and the next board meeting is on the 15th, November 15th. Yep. And just a reminder that the first is in Doty, so Doty is yes. hosting. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you, Megan. 
And uh, last but not least, any board reflections? And then I will open it to, we didn't, uh, Chris, you have your phone? Mm -hmm. your yeah, I, I don't know. I, I have another question. Yeah, um, go ahead. I just want to make sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so based on our recent um, uh, session with Mark, I think it's McDermott. Yeah. Was it Mark McDermott? Yeah, from okay. the yeah, um, office. Comment, and the, the public comment section of our meeting. Um, I thought he said during that, that session that having public comment as we're discussing an action item um, is a better fit. And so I would move that we or, or that we should consider modifying our public comment um, practice to allow for public comment uh, when we're actually discussing an item that we're going to vote on. I think I'll just offer this part, this clarification. I think what he was saying is the public comment at the beginning of the end and the end are specifically for items that are not on the agenda. And then the board can choose not to have a, another public comment, but if the board, after its discussion of something in a meeting, chooses to turn to anyone in the public and invite, they can, but it's not really listed as public comment. And the difference is that it's an agenda item. So everyone already knows you're talking about it. So the beginning and the end is really on things that are not on the agenda. Thank Which you, is Megan. fine, but I thought he, he also was saying that true public comment would allow comment when we're actually like voting on it on a, during that discussion, uh, when we're gonna vote, be voting on an item. So, uh, Chris, I, I think that uh, if if you want to bring this this conversation up, that might be something that we bring up when we start our work plan or when we start a retreat at the at the next year, or we bring it to the steering committee to to reflect on that. We could discuss it at this at the at the steering committee. I am hesitant to just say you know that's what we need to do now because we it has taken us years to get our meetings back to like in a way that we have proper public engagement and also uh, in a timely matter, be able to have a meeting of the board. So uh, that's, I'm, I'm happy to have a discussion with you and happy to have a, a discussion with the steering committee, but that's not something that I, I don't wanna change the process of our meetings. It, now, finally, that we have sort of a, <laughs> a rhythm to, to, our, to, our, to our meetings. So, but thank you for sharing that because it's a reflection uh, and I'll add it to the discussion of our mm -hmm. steering committee. Uh, okay. Okay. And then uh, we don't have a, for some reason, we missed in the agenda, it just as a German, but we usually have public comments right after uh, our reflection. So uh, I, I want to honor that and I apologize that we missed that when we were putting the agenda uh, together. So if there's members of the public that have specific comments, uh, could you please raise your hand so I can get a sense of how many we have? We typically allow 15 minutes for public comments and depending on how many we have is just two minutes, but if we just have a couple of pe people, we can have more time for you. I just see one hand up so far and it's Becca. Hi, Becca. Nice to see you. Uh, please go ahead. Thanks, Floor. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, I have a, I don't know, I have a couple of questions, but I also, thanks, Chris, for bringing up the the point about the public comment, and I I know you'll discuss this later um, as the board, but I do think it would feel more meaningful for members of the public to be able to ask questions or make comments during maybe after the board's conversation with with agenda items that are. Um, being discussed. So I just want to put a plug in for hoping that the board discusses that in more detail and perhaps finds a more meaningful way for the public to be part of the conversations and be able to um, uh, perhaps uh, inform and um, be generative along with you folks in the process. Um, and then I had a couple of questions from the budget presentation. Um, the first one is, do we have any um, it would be super helpful for me and other folks, I think, to know how 
how the percentage of the budget in that pie chart that you shared that comes from the general fund has changed over the last like decade or so. I know that general fund for education has really diminished. And I'm just curious about sort of what the impact is on how much um, we're supposed to be, we're trying to generate for the budget from property tax funds and uh, to make up that sort of difference in that change. So curious about um, how the percentage of general funds um, has changed over the years. I don't know if anyone has that data offhand or if that's something that you've shared with the board in another pack or something like that, but it would be, I think, super useful to understand actually the full landscape when we're talking about the budget realities. So that's question one. Shall I go into my second question or? Uh, yeah, we're writing, okay. writing it okay, down. Cool. Okay, great. Um, okay, and then my second question is, um, do we, I know that sort of overall the percentage of people who um, property tax owners or property owners who pay based on income is about two thirds of the state. Um, and I'm wondering if we know if that's different in our district or if we're sort of li in line. Um, and then I'm just curious, um, you know, because I know that folks who don't pay based on their income tend to actually pay less of a percentage sometimes of their income. So it's a great deal for people who um, uh, may choose, you know, it, it's interesting how that shakes out. So I'm just curious about if we know that percentage, um, if it lines up in our district or if it's different from town to town also. Those are my questions. Thanks. Thank you, Becca. We have mm -hmm. written down your questions. We'll get back to you. Uh, any you other so questions? All right. Hearing none, I was hoping to uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, members of the public, for joining us. Unless I'm forgetting something, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn. Thank you, Ursula. A second. Second. Thank you, Zach. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. And good night.